with her intellect and rigorous literary technique, making her the 20th century's most important female poet, while her name has become a byword for female angst. A cultural phenomenon no other modern writer has been quite so mythologised. Her writing and her life have become knotted into legend. She remains a potent influence on generations of readers and writers who often forge deeply personal connections with her work. A ferociously driven but also a deeply troubled and tragically doomed figure, today's history maker is Sylvia Plath. Born on October the 27th, 1932 in Boston, Massachusetts. Her mother was called Aurelia and her father was Otto. Extremely bright and a voracious reader, Plath's IQ was measured at 160, or effectively genius level. She was eight when her first poem was published in the Sunday Boston Herald. Plath's father, Otto, would die suddenly as a result of undiagnosed diabetes when she was eight after refusing medical attention for years. He was incorrectly convinced that he had cancer. The death of her father had a marked effect. Plath declared, I'll never speak to God again. It haunted her for the rest of her life. Plath's depression, it became clear, began soon after. A childhood friend claiming Plath had tried to cut her throat at the age of 10 and her face at 14. I just can't stand the idea of being mediocre, she admitted to her mother in October 1950, a few days after her 18th birthday. She was determined to succeed in everything she attempted, striving for perfection and dependent on her mother's praise. Her first degree was at Smith College, a prestigious elite women's college in Massachusetts. She attended on a full scholarship and waited tables, nannied in vacations, picked radishes to put herself through college. At Smith, she led a frenetic life, writing poems and journalistic pieces editing the Smith Review, she had earned a thousand dollars through her writing with her stories published in both Seventeen and Mademoiselle magazines. She also excelled academically but still found time to date many students at various Massachusetts elite colleges. At the same time, her journal describes her growing sensation of existing in a stifling, quote, bell jar and charts her anxious thoughts. In 1953, after her third year, Plath was awarded a coveted position as a guest editor at Mademoiselle magazine, during which she spent a summer month in New York City. The experience, however, was not what she had hoped for, and many of the the events that took place during that summer were later used as inspiration for her novel, The Bell Jar. When she returned from New York, she suffered a serious mental breakdown and had a suicide attempt following botched shock treatments for her depression. Plath overdosed and hid in a cellar where she was found after two days. While she survived this attempt, she spent the next six months in psychiatric care, receiving more electric and insulin shock treatments. Plath's poem, Daddy, makes clear her despair, 
by referring to her first serious suicide attempt in 1953. At 20, I tried to die and get back, back, back to you. Eventually, she returned to college and graduated in 1955, summa cum laude, the highest achievement possible. Upon graduating, she obtained a Fulbright scholarship to study at Newnham College, one of the two women-only colleges of the University of Cambridge in England, where she continued actively writing poetry and publishing her work in the student newspaper, Varsity. On the night of February 25th, 1956, at the launch party for a poetry journal in Cambridge, Plath met poet Ted Hughes, described by her as that big, dark, hunky boy, the only one there huge enough for me. I started yelling about his poems and quoting most dear unscratchable diamond and he yelled back colossal he kissed me bang smash on the mouth and ripped my hair band off and my favorite silver earrings and when he kissed my neck i bit him long and hard on the cheek the one man in the room who was as big as his poems huge with hulk and dynamic chunks of words. They very much saw themselves as Kathy and Heathcliff, Sylvia and Ted. Their relationship would be as volatile as that fictional pairing. They would be married in less than four months from that first meeting. Plath would write, the more intensely one lives, the more one burns and consumes oneself. A year later, they would move from Cambridge back to the US for a couple of years, with Plath initially teaching back at Smith College, returning to England in late 1959. While in the US, they would also stay at an artist colony where Plath says she learned to quote, to be true to my own weirdnesses. But she remained anxious about writing confessionally from deeply personal and private material. After moving back to England, their daughter Frida was born and later that year Plath published The Colossus, her first collection of poetry. In February 1961, Plath's second pregnancy ended in miscarriage. In a letter to her therapist, Plath wrote that Hughes beat her two days before the miscarriage. In August 1961, she finished The Bell Jar, a semi-autobiographical portrait of a young woman in 1950s America mentally disintegrating while on a fashion magazine placement in 1950s New York. It was published a month before Plath killed herself in 1963. The Bell Jar is the story of Esther Greenwood, a precociously clever 19-year-old wannabe poet who finds herself past from doctor to psychiatrist to asylum after sinking into suicidal despair. It envelops the reader within a suffocating, angsty microclimate that makes it impossible to separate the novel from the facts of Plath's own life. A portrait of appalling sadness mapped out with unsettling rigour. In late 1961, Hughes would meet Asia Weevil. He would then abandon Plath and their children, toddler Frida and baby Nicholas, to 
to live with Asia, already pregnant with his child. Beginning in October 1962, Plaff experienced a great burst of creativity and wrote most of the poems on which her reputation now rests, writing at least 26 of the poems of her posthumous collection, Ariel, during the final months of her life. This is her greatest writing, the viscerally intimate poems in Ariel, so personal, terror, blood, bodies, loss, not to mention daddy issues and the Nazis. It was with this work, published posthumously in 1965, that precipitated Plath's rise to fame and helped establish her reputation as one of the 20th century's best poets. In the UK, the winter of 1962-3 was one of the coldest in a hundred years. Pipes froze and Plath's children were often sick. Her depression returned. Plath described the quality of her despair as, quote, Owl's talons clenching my heart. On Monday, February the 11th, in the merciless winter frostquake at 23 Fitzroy Road in Primrose Hill, North London, the house where W.B. Yeats had once lived, her children asleep, their door sealed with tape, the gas tap was turned on. Plath gassed herself at around 7am on the day she was due to enter again a psychiatric ward. She was just 30 years old. As Hughes and Plath were legally married at the time of her death, Hughes inherited her estate, including all her written work. He has been condemned repeatedly for burning Plath's last journal and losing another and an unfinished novel. Plath is buried in Yorkshire where her gravestone has been repeatedly vandalised by those aggrieved that the word Hughes is written on the stone. They have attempted to chisel it off leaving only the name Sylvia Plath. Plath's resilience, genius and insight blaze through her life as does her ferocious work ethic. However, there is also self-doubt. Her poems use personal and nature-based depictions featuring, for example, the moon, blood, hospital, fetuses and skulls. Her work, The Colossus, is filled with themes of death redemption and resurrection. With Ariel, as soon as it was published, critics began to see the collection as the charting of Plath's increasing desperation or death wish. One critic said, quote, within a week of her death, intellectual London was hunched over copies of a strange and terrible poem she had written during her last sick slide towards suicide. Daddy was its title. Its subject was her morbid love hatred of her father. Its style was as brutal as a truncheon. Fear, hate, love, death and the poet's own identity become fused as black as heat with the figure of her father. While this has helped perpetuate the idea that her dramatic death was her most famous aspect, her work is far more than that and is truly that of a gifted writer. Plath pioneered a movement in women's writing and a way of finding alternatives for the limitations placed on women in 1950s America. Her lasting triumph being the power and precision of her 
poetic voice and her vision of new possibilities for women writers. Sylvia Plath is considered one of the greatest and most original poets of the 20th century, while her novel The Bell Jar has sold in huge numbers and is now regarded as a classic of modern fiction. While her life was t- tempestuous and ultimately tragic, the ever-growing list of biographies and critical works are a testimony to her mythic appeal and her astonishing poetic gifts. Sylvia Plath is without doubt a history maker. <laughs>